Thank you for joining us today. I want to welcome everyone to the STS 2023 webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Contemporary Treatment of Aortic Regurgitation and is sponsored by Yenaval Technology. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be available tomorrow morning on the STS website and STS YouTube channel. We invite you to become a member of STS. If you're not one already, you'll enjoy a variety of benefits and opportunities to help you grow professionally, plus discounts on educational offerings. Learn more at sts.org slash membership. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce STS moderators for this evening, Drs. Gaurav Alawadi and Yoshi Kaniko. Dr. Kaniko, welcome, and let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so the STS webinar series today, we will be talking about a contemporary treatment of aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation took a little bit of backseat compared to aortic stenosis, but because of the plethora of, plethora of new treatments that are coming up, I think it is regaining attention. And we have an expert panel to discuss after each of the talks. We have three prepared talks with uh, multiple discussion to follow. The moderator today will be myself, uh, Yoshi Kaneko, and Gaurav Alawadi. Um, Gaurav, do you want do you have a word as well? Yeah, well, thanks and welcome, everybody. I think there's a great turnout tonight. Uh, I think we're all seeing that our appreciation of aortic regurgitation is increasing. We're seeing more and more patients. And nowadays, it's a lot more thoughtful paradigm than just replacing the valve, including Ross procedures and aortic valve repair, and very excitingly, uh, a a TAVR valve that's designed for this. So we're going to hear all about that and try to see how it's going to fit in our practice. So thanks everybody for joining. Okay, I think we're going to get to our first talk. Um, the first talk is given by Dr. Munir Budwani at the uh, University of Ottawa. Uh, he will be talking about surgical aortic valve repair in the light of aortic regurgitation. So Munir, it's all yours. Wonderful. Um, just checking to see if you can hear me okay. Um, let me know if you can't. Um, and thanks for the invitation to uh, present today. Um, I'll be talking um, about uh, contemporary uh, uh, techniques in aortic valve repair for aortic insufficiency. Um, I'll try to cover in, in the short presentation three common uh, ideas. One is which patients are we talking about? Um, why aortic valve repair and give you a flavor for what and how uh, of aortic valve repair. So as we've heard already, um, you know, we see a lot of patients with aortic valve disease and uh, um, majority of these are patients with calcific aortic valve stenosis. Um, some of these patients will have severe aortic valve insufficiency as part of their pathophysiology. Um, there will be some patients that will have predominant severe aortic insufficiency, but with heavily calcified aortic valves. And I just want to point out that we are not talking about this population when we're talking about aortic valve repair. When we talk about aortic valve repair, we're talking about predominant severe aortic valve insufficiency. People can have mild aortic stenosis, but, but certainly uh, typically not moderate or greater AS without heavily calcified aortic valves. And these are the valves that we would consider eligible for repair. There are some exceptions to this rule, like unicuspid and quadricuspid valves in certain congenital uh, conditions, like patients who've had a prior switch operation and so on, um, which I'll leave out of the conversation for today. Now, the classification of aortic insufficiency, which was uh, really pioneered by the group uh, in Brussels uh, under Professor Al Khoury, has really given us a roadmap for how we think about aortic valve repair, thinking about annular and aortic uh, reasons for aortic insufficiency versus leaflet-related reasons for aortic insufficiency, similar to the Carpentier classification for mitral valve repair. And one or two observations from uh, understanding mechanisms of aortic insufficiency um, are that over a third of patients who have severe aortic valve insufficiency have multiple mechanisms contributing to their AI. Um, and that over 50% of patients have associated annular or aortic pathology, and more than 35% have some degree of cusp prolapse. So if we are going to be successful in repairing aortic valves, we have to be able to recognize and treat these multiple mechanisms, 
Uh, we need solutions for uh, associated aortic and in particular annular dilatation and disease. A few lessons learned uh, include that valve durability is in fact similar whether the valve is trileaflet or bicuspid, that preoperative severity of AI does not impact um, repair durability, and that aggressive treatment of annular dilatation has been associated with improved outcome. There have been, there's been one study that's looked at uh, impact of AV repair and survival, and this is a propensity match study. I should start by saying that there are no randomized controlled trials in this space. Um, so this propensity match study, small study, single center of 44 match pairs, um, suggested that patients who have repair uh, actually have better survival and close to age and sex match survival um, compared to the general population uh, versus replacement of the aortic valve. And a study from our center, again, propensity match, 70 match pairs patients, um, suggests that uh, if you wait a few years, that the uh, valve-related complications accumulated in the replacement group are higher than that in the repair group. So we're starting to see early comparative data to suggest that aortic valve repair does have advantages over replacement. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about techniques for aortic valve repair um, and try to highlight them through this case of a 54-year-old male who um, has uh, typical risk factors uh, for uh, uh, aortic disease, previous type B dissection treated with a TVAR, presented with congestive heart failure, severe aortic insufficiency, mild LV dysfunction. Um, this echo shows the long axis view with a mildly dilated aortic root at 4.1 centimeters trileaflet aortic valve with severe insufficiency and a suggestion on echo of left coronary cusp prolapse. Um, in this situation, you see the, the measurements of the aortic root measuring about 4.1 centimeters and an annulus that was dilated at uh, 27 millimeters. So when we inspect this valve, we see this trileaflet aortic valve. Now I'm trying to talk about some of what we've learned over the past two to three decades in how to take complex uh, uh, anatomy and pathophysiology and, and try to turn it into a competent valve. This valve has clearly thickness at the free margin in all three leaflets, uh, but there's good leaflet mobility. There aren't any significant fenestrations, and this shows uh, evidence of left coronary cusp prolapse with a fibrous band running across this cusp. In, uh, inspection of the root reveals that there's some thinning of the aortic root, which is often seen with ventricular aortic junction dilatation, but the root itself is not objectively dilated in terms of diameters. We measure geometric heights to determine whether there's sufficient leaflet tissue for us to preserve this valve. Um, and then we, we do our first initial maneuvers to try and see if this valve is repairable. And these first maneuvers are to determine whether we can create pliable cusps in this case, uh, we are shaving all three cusps in order to improve their mobility and pliability. A 6-O-proline suture in this case is passed through the thickened mid portion of the cusp and uh, uh, there's uh, a number 11 blade is used to shave the, the free margin of the cusps. And once this maneuver is complete, uh, we can see that uh, there's a bit more mobility to the cusp um, and, and some improvement in cusp excuse me, some improvement in cusp co-optation. Let me go back to that video. And you can see already some improved motion of the leaflets. Uh, because there is significant annular dilatation, we decided in this case to perform a valve sparing root replacement procedure with a reimplantation technique, uh, also given some degree of thinning uh, of the aortic root close to the VAJ. And this has really become the mainstay of uh, annular stabilization uh, in aortic valve repair. Certainly with, in patients uh, who have connective tissue disorders or significant root dilatation, uh, but also in some patients who may have severe uh, annular or ventricular aortic junction dilatation, even when the aortic root may not be uh, severely enlarged. And this external dissection really allows us to access the aortic valve annulus down to the level of the leaflet insertion and be able to act on it uh, so as to treat the annular pathology. Um, so dissection is carried out. In this particular case, the non-coronary sinus has been resected. Uh, the coronary buttons are now harvested, starting with the right. 
we then carry out our dissection uh, below the right coronary cusp down to the level of the leaflet insertion. We then harvest the left coronary button. and similarly dissect down uh, below it. And finally, and importantly, we uh, peel away the pulmonary artery and right ventricle from the aortic root in order to access the aortic annulus at that level. And this really requires a deep dissection that goes down into the muscular plane, uh, which you'll see happening uh, in a couple of seconds. Once this circumferential dissection has been performed, we now have access to the entire ventricular aortic junction. And this allows us to really perform a, a robust and durable annuloplasty of the aortic valve, which is critical for important long-term function of the valve. You can see that that maneuver uh, further improves leaflet mobility and cooptation. We sized the height of the interleaflet triangle. In this case, we chose a size 26 Valsalva graft, and we perform our proximal suture line of the uh, reimplantation procedure. Um, this is done with uh, plegeted uh, ethabon sutures placed circumferentially around the valve annulus. This is our Valsalva graft being tailored. A uh, small indentation is created at the, at the non-right commissure to accommodate uh, the membranous septum in that region. The sutures are passed through the base of the graft. The graft is parachuted down, it's tied into place, and we then reimplant the commissures. The commissures typically will land right at the end of the Valsalva portion of the graft. And we then perform the reimplantation of uh, the entire crown shaped aortic annulus uh, with a running fororoproline suture. I'll move through this section to uh, get us to the cusp repair. Uh, we use an effective height caliper to assess the effective height of all the cusps. And uh, as we had expected, we found in this case left coronary cusp prolapse. Prolapse is corrected with a central free margin plication suture. And once the suture has been placed, you can see that the three leaflets co-opt well, they're parallel to each other um, and with sufficient co-optation area. Um, in this particular case, we found a small residual leak at the left non-commissure, and we added a subcommercial annual plasty or cabral suture to further enhance co-optation. We perform our distal anastomosis, and this is the final view of the repaired valve. Uh, no regurgitation and uh, mean gradient in this case of five millimeters of mercury. So I'll summarize by saying that aortic valve repair is feasible for most patients with aortic insufficiency who don't have significant lethal calcification. And we have learned uh, a vast variety of uh, techniques that enable us to repair complex valves. Um, aortic valve repair appears to have good durability and, and a reduced risk of valve-related events compared to replacement. Um, and that understanding and treating all mechanisms of AI is critical to a successful and durable repair. I'd like to thank uh, the group for the invitation to present today. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, my video is not able to be played, but uh, next we're gonna have uh, Dr. Bino Tarani um, from Atlanta talk to us about the Yenna valve and TAVR for aortic regurgitation. At the end, we'll have some time for uh, discussion. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Gaurav, um, Yoshi, and the STS for uh, putting this webinar together. Can um, can you guys see the screen okay? I'm assuming yes. I'll keep going there. These are my disclosures. So just a couple of things. You know, when we look at the STS database, when we looked at uh, just from 2013 to 2018, we see that those patients that required isolated AVR 
of those 144,000, 23,000 actually had severe AR. And then you look at those that had an AVR and cabbage, you can see about 8,000 of them had severe AR. But overall, they're somewhere around 68,000 patients who had moderate or severe AR. So there's a lot of patients who have aortic regurgitation. The topic that was given to me today is talking about TAVR for aortic regurgitation. And there've been a long history of off-label TAVR usage for aortic regurgitation. One of the most well-known papers uh, describing this was from um, published in Jack, which looked at earlier uh, devices, you're just the core valve and the newer generation devices. And you can see that overall, there's still a high mortality, a high pacemaker rate, and a high um, a second valve, it's just really all the morbidity and mortality are not phenomenal at that point. And so what you notice is that overall, the post-procedure AR is greater than moderate in these, um, in these newer generation valves, but you can see overall, all-cause mortality is not great. And so leaving uh, moderate, M uh, moderate AR is bad, and there's a lot of it, um, and it really leads to a lot of mortality, 50% at, um, at one year. So not a great uh, pathway for this. When you look at a meta-analysis of these off, mainly off-label usage of 638 patients, you see a device success rate of 84%. In my mind, that is really low. And about uh, one out of 10 patients required a second valve and a 30-day mortality of uh, uh, 11%. And really, in my mind, a high rate of moderate severe aortic regurgitation. <clears throat> and the current uh, tower devices are not suitable for this for a variety of reasons, including uh, insufficient anchoring, which is the number one issue that you have. You can see some varieties of pictures there that can lead to this type of uh, sub, um, sub um, outcomes that we're used to for these procedures. So what we know is that the mortality rate of greater than 10% overall for aortic regurgitation occurs in severe symptomatic AR patients. It is a class one recommendation for those patients that are severe and symptomatic AR, uh, and especially with those with LV dysfunction. Severe is, AR is undertreated. It's a paper we published in 2021 in structural heart disease. Um, and only 25% of those patients in this study that we looked at received surgery, even though they had severe symptomatic AR. And then off-label TABRA has not been very successful overall. So here is um, <clears throat> the, the rest of the slides I'll talk to you about is a specific AR device called Yenavalve. And this is just a cartoon illustration of this. Very unlike other valves, you can see how the, the uh, commissures, these lay here on the, uh, between the root and the uh, leaflets. And then you're grabbing the leaflets themselves and then you deploy the valve. So it's a really nice uh, system. Um, and you can see here that you have the locator technology, <clears throat> which are three. And then you have porcine pericardium. You have very large open cell design. Um, and so it works out very well as far as corneal access is uh, unbelievably um, easy to do with this uh, system. But overall, again, it just a three cartoons to show you. First is the alignment, and you're able to completely, in one of the only valves that you have, complete commissure alignment. You're able to put these locators in each, three, uh, uh, each of the three sinuses. You drop it down into the sinuses. <clears throat> Pretty easy to, to figure out whether you're in these sinuses or not. And then you can see here the locator is between the root and the um, leaflet. And then the valve is on the inside of the leaflet. You grab the leaflets themselves, and you release the valve. So really allows a, a, a lot of um, uh, spe specific access to those patients who have aortic regurgitation. Right now, the three sizes, other sizes are going to be coming soon. And you can see that the perimeter range goes from 66 uh, all the way up to 90, which covers a large percentage of patients, but still will require uh, probably one larger size to cover the majority of patients. And a lot of our screen failures have been for that. This is what the handle looks like. Very simple, uh, very easy to use uh, for us that are in the trial doing this. Uh, and overall, it's a, a 18 French de device that we have. Just one quick case to show you here. You can see you do a root angiogram and a non-coronary cusp. You can see large aortic uh, root with an aortic insufficiency. You can see a patient who has um, a previous uh, coronary bypass surgery. One difference is, is that the actual sheath you can see comes all to the SGJ. And, and I think you can see with my mouse here, this goes all the way to the SGJ, uh, right? And you, here you can see the valve coming up into the uh, descending thoracic aorta. We now don't use a pigtail here anymore. We use an MP or some type of non-looping catheter. Uh, but basically that's, uh, that's uh, how we first started. And here, now you can see the valve is coming out of the sheath. Remember the sheath is at the SDJ. 
we do keep the ACT a little bit higher, about 300, um, instead of the routine 250. And here you can see the valve is very easily crossed uh, into the aortic valve. Here's the locators. And what we're doing is we're moving that gantry uh, RAO and LAO, in the, uh, and we're, we're looking for is the middle, uh, middle locator. And basically, if you're moving the, uh, the uh, gantry to the uh, II to the right, then that marker should go to the left. And so that really is a very simple way of doing it. If you are in the wrong commissure or if you're not completely in a good commissure, you actually just lift the valve up, rotate it, and then drop it back down. It's never taken me more than four or five minutes if I may happen to be in the wrong commissure. So it's pretty easy to do um, uh, for us. And then lastly, you can see you've got the locators really down deep into the sinuses here. You can see this one is in the non-coronary. You do a good angiogram. Um, again, this is we use we don't use a pigtail anymore. We just use a regular straight uh, catheter so that you don't catch these locators in the pigtail. Um, and then once you're happy with uh, a variety of views that we look at, you're able to go ahead and deploy the valve. Um, the valve is a very easy deployment. You don't necessarily need pacing. We've just recently started maybe pacing at 100, 120, um, but you don't need it uh, necessarily, even though that's now become our standard, just a very slow uh, burst of pacing, just to make sure that everything stays in place. And you can see the valve is now uh, open very nicely. And here's the final result. You can see a root shot, which shows zero aortic insufficiency. And here you can see an intraoperative echo, TE, and then a one month uh, trans thoracic showing no aortic insufficiency. So the Align AR study, is a prospective multicenter single arm study for severe symptomatic AR patients who were considered high risk. We had a, a sample size of 180. We have completed enrollment and we're looking at all cause mortality at one year, um, was our primary uh, endpoint. And, and then, of course, other 30 day uh, evaluations. Um, I'm uh, fortunate to, to share the leadership with uh, Torsen Vall uh, from Columbia University uh, and also uh, Marty Leon, who's a study chair. And then you can see um, Stefan Baldus from the from the um, the Europeans uh, and a variety of uh, both um, uh, U.S. and Europeans uh, who have been part of the um, Global Steering Committee for this. Uh, here are just some of the sites that are represented. Uh, Thirty sites that are represented on this slide. The uh, study endpoints, like I mentioned, are all cause one one year mortality, and then a composite safety endpoint at 30 days, consisting of uh, what you see here. Uh, for the primary si uh, safety endpoint. And enrollment has been completed. It was completed in uh, Q at the end of Q3 uh, 2022. So we obviously have to wait for our follow-up and we hope that um, later this year, we'll be able to submit to the FDA. And uh, hopefully with fingers crossed, we'll be able to have this valve in, in more hands than the 30, 30 sites that we currently have uh, in the United States uh, and abroad. It is available in Europe at the current time. Uh, the etiology of AR remains, uh, remains multifactorial. 13 to 15% of all SAVRs in the U.S. are for severe AI. Um, it may be more with moderate AI and concomitant with AS. The true prevalence is not, not offered by SAVR is absolutely underdetermined, uh, and we have no clue what that is uh, right now. Newer transcatheter transfemoral devices, I think, will have excellent outcomes in the early feasibility trials, and we're awaiting the outcomes of the Elan AR trial. Of course, there are areas of active investigation going on for novel TAVR devices, but also the timing of treatment and even those patients who have moderate AR with heart failure symptoms. So maybe I'll stop there, uh, Yoshi and Gorov, and um, I'll stop sharing um, and we can go on to the next, um, next topic. Thank you very much. Great, uh, so next we'll have uh, Marl, speak about the Ross procedure as this is also an important uh, consideration for patients with severe AI. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Gaurav and Yoshi and um, all the organizers for this in invitation. I think it's great to be talking about such a wide uh, variety armamentarium for aortic insufficiency. So um, my task is to talk about ROS for AI. We'll go through some of the long-term outcomes for ROS um, and the technical, some technical considerations when we're doing ROS for AI and a little bit about how we approach um, patients with isolated AI as a whole. So Ross procedure traditionally has been really uh, known to be ideal for active patients who have stenotic valves, a small annulus, and long life expectancy. 
And we often get this question of, you know, what about the patient with pure aortic insufficiency who has a dilated annulus? Is ROS going to be durable in these patients? So we'll look a little bit at the data and um, some of it is just sort of critically looking at what's actually been published in the literature, and it will give us the answer to that question. Um, this is the largest uh, multi-center ROS paper out there. It's the European ROS Registry. Um, almost 2,500 ROS patients, adult patients who had ROS procedure. It's multi-center, and it shows uh, that the ROS procedure in um, survival after the ROS is equivalent to the general population. No other valve replacement option, mechanical tissue, TAVI, has restored, has shown survival that restores survival to, um, back to the general population. So this is an important, important point for consideration. And when we look at the patients in this uh, multi-center approach, Pure AI was present in 22% of patients, mixed ASAI in 50%, and the mean aortic annular diameter was actually somewhat large at 27, and 63% of patients had a bicuspid valve. When we look at Tyrone's data from Toronto, this is the original cohort, and we're just now uh, updating our cohort to the more contemporary uh, Ross uh, cohort in Toronto. But when we look at the original 212 patients, young patients, 72% had bicuspid valve, pure AI in over a third with a mean annular diameter of 26, and over half had a dilated annulus. And so although we've been fairly conservative in Toronto in who we offer Ross to, the results are excellent and actually quite a high proportion of patients had uh, this phenotype that is considered to be not uh, appropriate or optimal for a ROS. Peter Skillington has the world's, uh, essentially the world's uh, best uh, results with ROS for AI, and he answered the specific question in patients with a bicuspid valve and pure AI, how do patients do? And, um, and mean annular diameter was 31 in his series. Survival is excellent, really can't be beat. And you look at the freedom from redo AVR or autograph dysfunction at 20 years, it's um, really excellent. Um, the, Amin Mazine, one of our residents, looked at all of the published uh, series in ROS, and this is just to show you that many centers have offered ROS with very good results, with pre-op AI ranging from anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. So I think when we think about the ROS literature, in fact, most uh, ROS papers do have a substantial proportion of patients who have um, uh, aortic insufficiency. And when we look at the comparative literature, so this is our recent propensity matched analysis, ROS compared to biological AVR in a propensity matched fashion. There's no um, uh, RCT, so we're stuck with observational data with its limitations, but we found a significant survival benefit after ROS. And when we look, when we look at ROS compared to biological AVR, these curves are interesting because you see that the curves up to 10 years are really overlapping. The reintervention rate is the same, ROS compared to biological AVR. And then after 10 years, the bio AVR group like skyrockets off the charts and reintervention in young patients after biological AVR is, uh, it's, a, it's a certainty. It's not, will they have reintervention? It's when will they have reintervention? And um, you see from these curves that you really have to follow valve patients into the second decade before you start seeing these differences. So that's an important point to remember. Ismail did a similar propensity matched analysis in New York State and California State data showing a survival benefit after ROS compared to the other options. You see that ROS is at the bottom uh, match to the uh, similar to the general population when the other two uh, curves are not. And reoperation, uh, again, is much worse after the biological valve options. So what about some technical things uh, to consider? So this was actually the paper that um, uh, gave uh, Ross uh, some of the bad reputation that it's had showing uh, it was the Rotterdam cohort. And of note, it's only it's less than 100 adults in this cohort. They had a very high reoperation rate at 13 years of 44% um, in adults and in, in the younger age group, it wasn't uh, it wasn't so bad. But in adults, it was really uh, very high. Um, but what's interesting about this paper, and they reported later how these valves failed, most of the diameter, it, the, the valves fail after ROS for AI primarily because of the annular dilatation. 
most of the diameter increase in these patients had actually already happened at the at the time of hospital discharge and not later. And so this um, the point of this is really that technique matters when doing ROS, particularly when doing ROS for AI. So Ismail has written to uh, very uh, outstanding technical papers on how to do a ROS procedure and particularly how to avoid some of the pitfalls that we saw in the earlier years with ROS. And these are the principles and we can make talk a little bit about the discussion in the discussion section, but I'd point you to those papers. They're really uh, very well done. Trimming the autograft muscle so that there's no excess muscle um, uh, during implantation is key. That muscle is just going to die. It doesn't uh, provide any additional support. Implanting the autograft deep inside the LVOT is also very key so that the fibroskeleton of the aortic annulus supports the autograft. Um, cutting the uh, autograft essentially uh, right above the commissures. You don't want to leave excess autograft above the commissures. There's no point. It doesn't do anything. It's just prone to die. Dilatation. And then uh, STJ stabilization is also very important. We have a very low threshold to replace the ascending aorta if there's a mismatch, even if it's mildly dilated in the 40s. 40s is okay for a prosthetic valve, but in, a, in an autograft, it's not uh, in the long term, we think there's a risk factor for failure. So a short Dacron graft replacement of the ascending aorta to stabilize this. So um, uh, if we mobilize the root at the time of root preparation, if the annulus is enlarged, if it's larger than 26, 27 millimeters, low threshold to do an extra aortic annuloplasty to support the ROS and paying specific attention to commissural symmetry and commissural height in these patients. We spoke about uh, how to really trim that uh, autograft and implant the valve deep inside the LVOT. Technical modifications for AI, there's been uh, several that have been suggested. Um, full uh, root replacement with autologous inclusion uh, technique. Uh, Peter Skillington is the most uh, well known for that uh, technique. Um, full root replacement into Dacron graft, the whole thing in a Dacron graft has been uh, done uh, mostly by um, uh, uh, several groups have done it. Von Starnes has published on it and uh, this is a good option to prevent late dilatation but now the whole autograft is within the within uh, Dacron. And um, what we have been doing and others have been doing is a root replacement, but stabilizing the um, autograft both at the annulus as well as at the STJ. Um, and this, uh, the Canadian group looked at what happens with this approach to ROS and found uh, it's early data. It's only up to three, four years, but the uh, diameter of the annulus and the sinuses and the STJ have remained very stable over time. So the early outcomes after ROS are certainly volume dependent and the late outcomes are depend on patient selection and also technique. Technique really matters with the ROS. So what's our algorithm for someone with pure AI? So uh, I saw a few people in clinic today. I have the same conversation with them over and over for pure aortic insufficiency. We're going to try to repair your valve. Um, Munir gave an excellent talk about the options um, and, and how to approach a aortic valve repair. If we cannot do a repair, you may be eligible for a ROS if you have good long life expectancy and your pulmonary valve is um, is uh, uh, is normal. Um, and then we always have Plan C. So this is sort of what uh, we go into the operating room with this uh, this type of approach for these patients. So those with an unrepairable aortic valve, we learned today there's a lot of options. The Jenna valve has some uh, you know exciting new technology. Uh, certainly uh, for those with limited life expectancy, I think a trans catheter option is is quite good but if you have somebody who's uh, we expect to live um uh for for a long time i think uh ross even with annular dilatation for pure aortic insufficiency is an excellent option so um uh, i think the points to make are that the full spectrum of choices should be discussed with patients in non-elderly patients the focus really should be on long-term results and getting patients uh the best long-term outcome and the younger the patient is is, um, in my opinion, the more we can push that suboptimal anatomical substrate for ROS. 
So there's really many options for treating AI. You've heard many in the webinar and hoping to have some uh, good discussion now. Uh, but the Ross procedure really is an excellent option for patients with good life expectancy and unrepairable valves. And the technical modifications and really attention to detail is really key to minimizing the risk of reoperation on the autograft. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Marav. Um, you know, wonderful. And we have all the panelists up. Um, I have a sort of question. Uh, we have plenty of time to discuss, but uh, I want to start the discussion by asking a question for you. Um, after you talk, I think there was a question in the chat as well, but um, can you talk about other ways of repairing plastic? And I also want Pooja Patino, who is one of our panelists from WashU, want to comment on that. You know, are there any other commercial rings that are coming up to allow us to not have to do a reimplantation technique? Punjir, Pooja? Yep. Uh, Pooja. Pooja, did you want to take that first? Why don't you go ahead? I, I, I missed the first part of the question. I think there was a lot of noise in there. Munir, go ahead. So I, I think the question, uh, Yoshi, has to do with uh, other technologies that will help us address annular uh, issues with uh, insufficient aortic valves. And absolutely, I think that space is probably the, the one space in aortic valve repair that's increasing the most. Um, we have seen uh, the external Dacron rings, the uh, ones that have been um, uh, promulgated by Emmanuel Lansac. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a version of this that is used with the remodeling technique. I think Morale in her one of her videos showed an external ring support of a Ross, and that's an excellent option. Um, it's uh, the, the pitfall there is the need to externally dissect down to the ventricular aortic junction level, which is sometimes challenging to do when you have the coronary arteries intact. And especially, um, I think, something to watch for if you have uh, some uh, abnormalities in your coronary arteries. Um, there's, of course, the internal ring, um, and the internal ring is a, you know, a rigid internal ring that's implanted subvalvular. Um, my personal view on that is that I think that we, we need to wait and see the data on this. The early data has not been uh, as good as one might expect. There's been some early failures um, with that, and uh, many people who initially adopted uh, this have, have kind of walked away from this. Um, the, the concerns I would have are the immobilization of the aortic valve annulus, which is really a dynamic structure, and the interactions with the valve leaflets. Um, having said that, I think there are two or three other areas, um, uh, technologies that are kind of emerging in that space, and, and we'll have to wait and see um, what the longer term outcomes are uh, of some of those and whether they allow us to, to have an easier implant than to do a full root replacement in these patients. Pooja, anything to add in terms of, you know, internal rings, other devices? Yeah, so I, I sort of agree with um, Munir's comment about this internal ring, um, you know, and some of the ones that initially we had uh, taken on early and um, some of the failures that have been reported are that there, um, it sits below the level of the annulus within the, uh, within the LVOT, it also can cause some interference with the valve leaflets um, and leading to some um, uh, retraction of the leaflets. And that's indicated as one of the uh, rates of failure for reintervention. Also, we've seen some erosion of it and dehiscence of the valve ring. So I think that the internal and the internal um, stabilization, while it's easier to do that dissection because you don't really have to dissect outside of the annulus's um, you know, is I'm not sure the long-term data is going to really pan out in that just by fixing it. Now, it's easy to say that, you know, we're going to use um, a biological uh, solution and kind of do a re remodeling sort of procedure. I think the, the points I want to stress about Munir's talks were, I think in order to do a really good valve repair, we need good cusps. And I think he pointed that out really well, that we need enough of a cusp size and the geometric height, which he Kind of glossed over, but I think that's really important. And, you know, he cut out the abnormal tissue. I think it's important to talk about um, the stabilization of the annulus, both at the level of the ventricular aortic junction, but also at the sinotubular junction. And I've noticed a couple of the valve failures um, or the failures from the internal rings have been that there's, you don't know, address that pathology. You address the, the, the ventricular aorta junction, but you don't really address the SDJ and, so the, and the sinuses. And so they come back 
and have dilated annuluses and valve failure as a result of that. So I think there's a number of problems with internal rings, but I think external rings, especially in the Ross procedure, have worked out really well. Um, but I think overall, the, the cusps have to be great, and you have to stabilize both parts of the annulus as well as the FPJ. I, I, that's a great discussion. And, you know, one, I think some of the technical considerations we'd love to hear about are when you do use an external ring, like uh, Marl showed, for example. Um, there's some questions about how do you make sure it's the right size? How do you down, downsize it enough? Obviously for mitral disease, that's easier to do. You're looking at it, you can do a saline test here. You can't really do that. How do you know you've downsized it appropriately, not cause narrowing? You tie it over a Hagar, yeah. what, what, are the, what are the tricks that you guys do? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I can take it and, and maybe get uh, views from others as well. Um, so, you know, one of the things uh, we've learned from uh, doing the David procedure is that sizing can be performed in a number of different ways. It can be performed by bringing the leaflets together, assessing what that optimal coaptation is, and then choosing the angular size that corresponds to that good leaflet coaptation. Um, or what I showed in the video is that you can simply measure the height of the interleaflet triangle at the non-left commissure. And actually that I think can be used reproducibly for external rings as well. That's what I do. Um, if I'm using an external ring, I'll size that. Um, and if it turns out to be 26 or 28, that's what I want my uh, external ring to be. Um, my solution to an external ring is a bit um, simpler. I don't use a commercial device. I use a Dacron graft and I cut a ring, three or four rings off a Dacron graft. And that way I know what it is. Um, I cut it in the middle. Uh, and then I implanted using the exact same technique as a reimplantation procedure. So the same sort of internal angular support, um, leaving a gap for the coronaries. And then you can reconnect your cut Dacron ring uh, at the end. So you know that you've got exactly the external size that you had intended. So that's you, that's yeah, my approach. How many sutures do you put in, Munir, for, um, for the it, external? It, it tends to be somewhere between like eight and 10. Um, because you're leaving a couple of gaps for the coronaries. Normally for a David procedure, it tends to be 12 for me or between 10 and, and 12 for me. Uh, so eight to 10. I think there's also a question from the, uh, from the chat. Um, does bicuspid aortic valve change your view of repair versus ROS? And Morel, I have a question specifically to you. When do you consider uh, a valve not, uh, not repairable? Yeah. And shoot more towards Ross. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question, and I think it's a little bit of a moving target. Um, for me, you know, personally, if the valve, if it's a bicuspid valve that's very asymmetrical, so close to closer to 120, so 140 degrees, the commissural orientation, and we're going to have to patch the valve to get an adequate repair, um, then I actually think Ross may be in fact more durable and worth the, you know, worth the additional uh, effort um, compared to, compared to repair. Um, the bicuspid valves that are favorable for repair are uh, certainly, you know, the one, the really symmetrical ones are beautiful. They're less common, though most of them are, uh, you know, Seavers one and uh, somewhat asymmetrical. And if they're if they can be turned into uh, equalized, turned into 180, 180, um, and they're in the 150, 160 range, and they look fairly, and they have, you know, they have uh, adequate. As Munir said, it's the the geometric height and the quality of the cusp is really important. Mm -hmm. um, for me, unicuspid valves or having to put patches in there, um, not really durable. We know it's a risk factor for late failure, and Ross is a more reliable long-term uh, option. Vino? Yeah, I have, I have a question for Marl and, and, and the team there. Um, you know, we have two Canadian speakers who are talking a lot about Ross. Have you noticed that in Canada that it's not just concentrated? Because this is a major concern that we've been talking about at the society yeah. level is... Um, how are we going to teach this to a lot of surgeons? We can't send every we can't send thirty thousand patients to three people in the U.S. or five people in the U.S. That's not going to work, right? So in Canada, I think you've been doing this a little bit longer in the sense now with Ismail coming to the U.S. that, that brings another raw surgeon here, but also Canadian. And it seems like there's been a higher proliferation of Rosses in Canada than they have in the U.S. Have you actually seen an expansion of raw surgeons in Canada? Have you been able to teach this reliably, or is it still sticking? with three or four centers or four or five centers 
And have you not made a proliferation of surgeons doing this at a high level? So I'm curious about that because that will extrapolate, I think, into what's going to happen to into the United States. Yeah, I, I think it's a great comment. Um, and um, so I think the landscape is a little bit different in Canada. Um, we happen to have several Ross uh, surgeons in Ontario, I think more than sort of uh, um, um, <laughs> like the U.S. put together, but I don't want to say for sure, but um, we're actually looking at the data. So I um, we have STS data that we just uh, received uh, from the STS database, and we're going to report on how uh, center volume, how many surgeons are doing Ross, what the trends have been in the last 10 years. I think we will see that the trends are increasing. Ismail's done a lot to teach us, to teach all of us, I, I think in Ontario and in North America. And having a reproducible technique that is teachable to uh, surgeons is key. Um, expert root surgeons who are comfortable doing that dissection for a valve sparing root, um, I think is a, a starting point. The learning curve for Ross has also been reported on and it's steep. It's about 75 cases. It's, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not, sh uh, it's not a quick learning curve. It requires a dedicated surgeon. I think it's very teachable in a, for an aortic root surgeon to do it, but you have to commit to it and uh, do it and not do it. If you only do it on the perfect person. And this was sort of, you know, my struggles when I first started doing Ross, if you wait for the 40 year old uh, female with, uh, you know, severe AS and a small annuals, you'll only be doing a handful a year. And yeah. we learned from the Rotterdam and other, you know, the Brett Reese paper that slow volume for Ross is not a great idea. Munir, do you want to comment on that? Uh, on that? Yeah, you know, I echo 100% what Morel said. Um, I think the only thing I would add is that we are now seeing that every major center in Canada has one Ross surgeon. Like it's not the type of surgery that five surgeons will do at any given center, but every center should have every large mid to large center could develop, has enough volume to develop a single Ross surgeon. And, and that's the great way to kind of, uh, you know, build that expertise and concentrate it. And I, I, I would, the only other comment I would add is that, you know, if you look back 30 years ago, we were saying stuff like this about mitral valve repair. Like not everyone would do it. A few people could do it, but not everyone can do it. And now, you know, we have centers of excellence in mitral valve surgery and we have reproducibility. So I think the same could apply to the Ross uh, if with the right mindset. Right, thanks. Yeah, so there are several uh, questions in the chat. I think a lot of it's related to the technique of annular stabilization. So um, we'll just try to go through a couple of them, but I do want to leave some time to discuss uh, TAVR and, and the Yana valve and where that's going to fit in. So, uh, Marl, a couple questions for you, and, and Manir is certainly welcome to chime in as well. Um, what do you think about using uh, annular stabilization with Gore-Tex suture, as uh, Professor Schaefer's has, has described? I, I think um, uh, I, I don't have experience with it, so I can't comment uh, um, uh, too much on it. I'm not sure it's going to be robust enough to really kind of hold things together, but his results are very good. Um, I think for Ross, um, uh, uh, like a full Dacron ring or, uh, you know, complete external stabilization, and it has to be down at the right level. You know, that's the key. Um, it has to be really, you have to get down to all the way circumferential uh, at the basal ring it can't be riding up high in one area or another otherwise it'll be distorted but um uh, i'm not uh, uh do, you hear, do you have comments about the gore-tex uh, yeah I, I you know i've seen videos of it i don't have personal experience with it um i think uh there have been a couple of cases of coronary artery issues with it but i think technical improvements um have emerged to kind of deal with that uh, long-term data is still pending but I think from a conceptual point of view, I'd add one other point, which is that I don't think we use annular reduction at that level necessarily in a symmetric fashion for aortic valve repair. We actually use annular reduction as, uh, as, as part of an annular remodeling process. So if you take a bicuspid valve that's, you know, 160 um, uh, uh, degrees and not one, you know, not your 180, 180, and uh, when you adjust the annulus, you actually create symmetry at that ventricular aortic junction level. And if you have a simply a Gore-Tex suture that you tighten around a Hagar, you don't have the ability to do that. So I, I think we need to be smarter when we think about annular remodeling in aortic valve repair. Yeah, great point. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, maybe maybe some things for us to think about is 
what, what's the right number of the volume? You know, I think Vino's comment was really spot on. Um, in the US, we've got just a handful. Is there a volume in, in your experience in the literature? What's, what's a good volume to have to be able to say, I've gotten over the learning curve? Yeah, you know, the, the thing with uh, aortic valve repair is that there will be some variability from valve to valve. So it's not like a Ross procedure where you cut out a valve and you're doing the same technique or like, uh, uh, you know, in case of a TAVR, you, you can reproduce it. I think with the aortic valve repair, you're tailoring it to the specific pathology in front of you. Um, so I think the aortic, uh, the learning curve can be a bit higher. Um, but this is where I think we don't have to do all the cases to learn from the cases. I think meetings where we bring together, uh, you know, great videos of, of failed repairs sometimes um, or repairs which are challenging or have certain unique elements to them. I think those types of conversations amongst surgeons will substantially reduce the learning curve. And, you know, we, we do these symposia uh, two or three times a year on aortic valve repair. We do live cases or uh, we do a lot of video based teaching. Um, I think that can substantially reduce your learning curve. I, I, we, we also looked at the learning curve earlier in my practice and found it to be somewhere around 50 uh, cases, 50 to 60 cases. But that questions, you know, where do you start with? If you start with fellowship training in aortic valve repair, that's your learning curve. But if you've never done this before, it might be a little bit different. Um, I mean, should this aortic valve repair surgeon and the Ross surgeon be the same person in that institution? 100%. Yes, yes for sure. I think so. You're it's a it's an aortic root expert who that's what you need um, because you have to be able to transition from repair to ROS if it's not repairable and um, the the uh, you have to understand the root geometry, be able to modify the annular di you know dimensions and the geometry and so on um, in this in in sort of similar all the concepts are similar have that you know STJ stabilization annular stabilization the commissures have to be you know the leaflet heights have to be all good and so on so the concepts are very similar and I think it is the same type of surgeon the same phenotype um, and you don't need you know 10 of them in a center in Canada we're a bit lucky because we're already fairly regionalized there's only 33 centers in the whole country for cardiac yeah, surgery unique. so that's what's unique and I, I agree with that final real quick question because we got to move to Taver. Uh, can you comment on using ROS in patients with connective tissue disorder? How do you feel about that? No. <laughs> Done. Okay. Easy, easy answer. There's lots of comments in the chat about uh, the internal ring, the heart ring, which is commercially available both in Europe and in the U.S. And uh, there's uh, some folks that believe that there there actually are good results. There's some been some modifications. There's some videos that you can look at uh, on MMCTS. I want to just let everybody know that. Um, I'd like to just shift gears for a few minutes since we've got about five minutes left. And um, what what do you and let's get Gilbert involved. Gilbert, where do you see uh, TAVR fitting into the treatment of AR? What type of patients, both when it first gets approved and ultimately when it maybe gets a little more mainstream and there are studies and not necessarily the highest of risk patients, where do you where do you see it fitting in? And then we'll have Vino answer the same question. Yeah, I think the ones that are, would benefit, uh, there are certain subgroups, obviously, they would typically be high surgical risk elderly patients without aortopathy. I mean, there was a, uh, someone in the Q&A about, you know, when do you uh, taver in someone aortopathy? What's the cutoff in the Yenabal trial, you know, in terms of the, the aortic diameter? Uh, but also, I think there is a group of patients, and, and uh, we know and others can comment on this, is this LBAT-induced AR. There's no good solution in these patients, uh, you know, and, and they end up being recirculating and they're very symptomatic. And I think from a palliative standpoint, this could be a potential game changer in these patients uh, because typically, you know, if you don't do it percutaneous, you don't have to go back in and then, and then you know, do a park stitch or, or do some kind of uh, replacement uh, to, to eliminate the AR, which can be obviously quite hostile. You know, uh, there have been some papers published on LBAT induced AR with TAVR and, you know, that, and the results have been uh, relatively mixed. So I think this could be another area. One thing I would have to ask Vino based on his experience with Yenabao is, you know, it's a sizing, right? In terms of, do you want to oversize? Uh, how much oversize? And, and I understand that some of the, these AR technologies have had quite a high pacemaker rate because the oversizing. Uh, so maybe Vino, you want to comment on some of those? Yeah, um, go back. yeah, thanks. Um, so I would say that we, we used to oversize a lot and the pacemaker rate was higher in the, in the almost a 20% rate, you know, much higher. But as we've done a true sizing, We've noticed that with AI, you don't have to push down hard with the valve to make sure it seats on itself. 
you can relax a little bit into the root. Um, so it's become uh, lower. I think that will probably end up with somewhere around 10 to 15%, though, I have to be honest with you. With the current technology, I think we'll have to make some advancements as far as that technology goes. And go out to get to your point a little bit. I think the LVAD patient population is huge. Um, and and um, I think that patient, we have not studied that with Yenavalve, except for some case results in compassionate cases, where, um, you know, hopefully if, if everything works out, the valve gets released next year, I think that we'll probably put a registry together, you know, a post a post analysis registry on how to do that. It's been very difficult to do that within the, the, the trial currently, because there's so much other areas to look at. I personally think that we could probably go into intermediate risk type of patients with this. Um, I think that's kind of the next aspect of it. You can go all the way down to low coronary access for this garb. You can go down to three to four millimeters because the way the valve is com completely commercial aligned, you can have a patient down the road. You know, I can foresee this valve being used with a, potentially if we can get the indications for an AS patient with a three millimeter coronaries because you have full coronary access. So it really is completely aligned with the commissures, unlike a Tiver valve, you know, that you put in now that has really no alignment with any coronaries. It just, it just is there. And you can, you know, Gilbert, you've talked a lot about this and have done a great job with it, but we're not, we're not a hundred percent perfect with alignment in, in any of the valves currently uh, for this. So I think this is the beginning. I think that there'll be some studies that we've been talking about. In fact, today about, you know, where to take this um, technology. FDA is interested in getting this into younger uh, medium risk patients. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, we're just scratching the surface for this. And I think there's a lot of AI patients out there that we're leaving that just aren't even coming to us. Yeah, I think the other population, you know, I'm sure you've thought about as well are the failed sutureless valves like a freestyle that typically fail with yeah, AI. Yeah, homographs. Yeah. So great. Manir has a question. I, I think it's a perfect segue, uh, you know, around um, uh, AR, uh, some degree of root pathology, which is very common, and, and the notion of the endobentol. I don't know if uh, either yourself or, or Gilbert have comments on sort of where that technology is, is at and where it's going. Go ahead, Gilbert. Yeah, I mean, I think that they have a case report from Brazil, which is like a custom-made uh, device uh, solution. I think the issue is coronary. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the branch and also maintaining, uh, you know, perfusion, we, we avoid thrombosis. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think the next step is ascending a endograph. As you know, you've been involved uh, in a lot of these technologies. That has to be done first. I think the issue is sizing and anchoring. Uh, with, and so there's some question about, well, maybe just anchor from the LVOT up, right? Then there's no issue with uh, dilatation or, uh, but of course, I think the coronary has been the kind of uh, a difficult problem to solve in the holy grail. And company, I think it hasn't really pushed much of this because there's not really a big market for it right now. I, I think that is the challenge in terms of pushing R&D dollars in it, most of them still putting money through tower and getting a better better valve. And, and, and so I think it will be coming ultimately, I'm sure maybe next 10, 15 years, but I think right now it's still kind of conceptual and, and maybe kind of custom made solution. Like you, you've seen some of these. I think we can extend this five more minutes in terms of discussion. So I do want to ask all the panelists, um, how does the treatment of AI look five years from now? I want everybody's comment on this in terms of ROS, aortic valve repair, and of course, Taver technology. I, I'm going to take a stab at this, uh, Yoshi. I think the first thing is, uh, as Vino and others mentioned, we need to actually diagnose this properly. I think one of the things that we've had problems, and we've all seen this, echo, transferase echo particular, miss a lot of these patients. Oh, it looks like it's only moderate or mild, but when you really interrogate with TEE, it's like to wide open. I mean, because you just cannot get those images and we've seen that. And I think we need to really come up, work with our cardiology colleagues to actually increase the diagnosis, diagnostic uh, accuracy of, of AR. Because uh, a lot of these, as you know, are eccentric, they're not central AR. Uh, and so many of these are missed. And when we start with this, I believe, I, trust me, I think the volume is the, the number of patients that refer to any of these centers will, will go exponentially uh, increase. It's a good point. And not, not just the diagnosis, but also when we're intervening. Um, you know, from mitral insufficiency, we learned, you know, early on that to even in asymptomatic patients, when once you see LV dilatation, I have a young guy now who has endocarditis, 20, an inpatient, 26 years old, um, but he had, you know, missed uh, severe AI for so long. His EF is like maybe 30 at best, eight centimeter ventricle, 
I'm not going to do a Ross on him because I need him to survive this first operation. And then maybe, you know, a Ross at the re time of the redo, but I think we're see we're treating patients with AI a bit too late. And we will learn that if we do it a little bit earlier, the options will be better repair Ross and et cetera. Um, and patients will be able to, they have a little more time to, um, uh, get reconstructive surgery and actually have, uh, have the best treatment for it. You know, so Yoshi, I think that um, I think it will be categorized. I think patients who are younger and patients who are lower risk will and it can take a second cross clamp, can take a longer cross clamp, will go into a more reparative pathway. We're talking about pure AI at this point. I don't think that a 75 year old is going to get routinely get a Ross procedure. It's just that's my own personal feeling. Or some of you, you know, 79. The people that I operate on are not going to get Rosses, period. I'm not going to do a Ross on an 80-year-old. So, so the point of it is, I think that the younger patients will have, just like we do for mitral valves, right? We're a lot more aggressive about that. I think the intermediate risk and the more high-risk patients will start to head towards the transcatheter pathway um, because they can go home in a day or so. And we believe that they're going to have a good 10 to 15-year survivability I think that's kind of the pathway that I see. And I think the stented valves or the you know mechanical valves are still options for people. I think that's still what the average cardiac surgeon is going to do. Just for you to know, an average heart surgeon, Marel and, and Munir, you probably know this, but an average heart surgeon in the United States, the, the hospital does one AVR a month. Okay. That person, that surgeon is not going to be doing a Ross as his one valve replacement a month for aortic valve. So I think we'll have to see how it shakes out, but I think we'll start to break them up into low, medium, and high risk patients. I think that's what will dictate what happens to them. I do agree with that. And I think that uh, asymptomatic AI is the area that we really haven't tapped. You know, the conversation that you brought up, Gilbert and Morale, you sort of added. But I think this asymptomatic AI, when to intervene, is probably something that will be a really hot topic over the next few years for sure. Because, you know, you don't want to wait until the the diameter that Munir showed, you know, LVDD of 75. That's that's humongous. You don't want to wait until that long. And I think that that diagnosis has to come sooner. That That's where the guidelines will need to evolve, as everybody's saying. So we'll wait for our societies to help with that. I think it's 605. I think we had a great discussion. Um, I would like to thank all the panels and the speakers for participating today. And I specifically want to thank Yenaval for supporting this uh, webinar. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the night. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much to Yenaval for sponsoring this webinar and all uh, big thanks to our moderators and our great panelists for today. Um, the STS ebook has a chapter called Aortic Valve Repair and Valve Sparing Aortic Root Replacement uh, chapter. Uh, you can scan this code and get learn more information. Um, we also are <clears throat> having a coronary conference in an STS coronary conference 2023, June 3rd through 4th, 2023 in Miami, Florida. Registration starts now and there's also scholarships available. Please visit sts.org slash coronaryconf to register. And thank you so much for participating. And you can check out the recording on sts.org. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much.